Hi everyone and welcome to my updated PoE beginner's guide. I want to give you everything you need to just jump into the game and get started if you do it for the first time, if you don't know anything. A lot of people say that you know it's quite intimidating with the passive tree and uh, how the skill system works. It is very special in this game compared to most other RPGs. But in the end, if you understand the core concepts, it's not really such a big deal. There is a lot of things to learn, but you shouldn't really worry about making a build that doesn't work really well in the endgame or something. In the end, it's just about playing through the campaign first. The campaign has 10 acts, it's quite long, and I want to give you what is needed to get through it smoothly. So let's start with the skills. The skills in this game work in the way that they are itemized. So we have these so-called skill gems and basically these are items you can get from quests, you can buy them from vendors and any class in the game can use any skill. So you don't get all of them for every class at the beginning but eventually you unlock them all throughout the campaign and you can do anything you like. You can have a ranger that casts spells, you can have a berserker that casts spells, you can have a, a witch that attacks in melee, you can do anything. It doesn't necessarily turn out to be very great, but it's possible. And the way that this works is you have items with sockets. And you see here I have red, green and blue. And you put these skill gems into your items and that will unlock the skill. You can see my skill bar here on the bottom right. And if I put in this fireball here into the blue, I have a new skill now. And essentially you can just swap out the skills like this with another spill. For example, here is a fire storm. So I can put that in. And you see my right click again will change to another skill here. So the spell looks like this and the firestorm will look like this. And now you can see that there's more of these sockets here and essentially you can socket um, a certain amount of skill gems and there's also support gems. So what support gems do is they alter or buff the skill that you use. So one example I can do with the fireball here is we have the singular fireball, it deals a bit of damage and has uh, some burn effect if you crit and these kind of things. And now we have something like volley support and we can put that in into the green and that will link to this fireball here. You can see at the very top it has this uh, support tag and the projectile tag in the second line. And you can also see here on the fireball it has this projectile tag and this means that they will work together. You can also see that these sockets here are linked on the item, there's like a little line between them. And, this, and also when you mouse over them, they will highlight with um, this white outline. You see here on this item, for example, I have two singular red gems and they're not linked. And also this green one is not linked to anything. But these are connected and now the fireball will cast three fireballs because this is what the support gem does. It says it fires two additional projectiles, but they deal less damage. And this is like one of these little examples and there's like, like hundreds of skill and support gems combined. I think that's close to 200 at this point that uh, you can do a lot of combos with. You can even do some other stuff like uh, take a trap support and now instead of uh, shooting a fireball, we throw the trap and that trap will uh, explode or uh, just time out and then fire the fireball into a random direction or when you throw it at the enemy, you can uh, do the fireballs like this. And there's tons of different skills. There's many melee skills, there's bow skills, there are uh, totems, there are traps, there are minions. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do and then you have the passive tree and here you basically just try to find the, the passives that optimize your setup that you want to do. Most of the time you want to focus on one or two skills and one is usually used for AOE clearing and one is used for more single target and uh, this is how most builds work if you're not playing some kind of minion build or so. Of course there's many ways to play this but the typical like spellcaster or attack builds do it that way. Aside from your main skills, you usually combine this with maybe some defense or some auras and also some mobility skill. For example, here my mobility skill is called Flame Dash. It looks like this, so you can teleport around like this with a few charges and then it has to recharge. So you typically always have like one mobility skill. You typically have like one or two auras or so-called heralds. And also there are flasks in this game. So you have like life flasks, you can try to find like one or two and keep them ready for you. So whenever you take damage, you just pop them. And there's also like utility flasks, especially the Quicksilver. There's like one quest right at the start uh, here in Act 1. So uh, it's here in the Tidal Island, just like the second zone. And you get a Quicksilver flask that gives you a 40% increased movement speed when you use it. So this is pretty neat. You can see the effect here, I walk really fast. And you can also find other utility flasks that are quite useful. 
and they usually last a few seconds and when you kill enemies they will refill. The important thing is that you scale the same stats for your two different skills. So when you look at a passive tree you have a lot of nodes that give you certain like passive bonuses. You don't get active skills here. And uh, you basically start out, this is a starting area for my class here, this is a Templar. And from there you can either go this path or you can go this. And then you can basically path along and you see you have like different, um, these are called nodes. And here I scale elemental damage because both of my skills do fire damage. And then we go towards some life and we try to get more essentially elemental damage, fire damage and uh, these kind of things. In my case I'm also a spellcaster so I can go for something like spell crit, spell damage and fire damage and essentially you just want to scale the same stats for your two different skills. So it doesn't really matter if you play the same thing, if you play like a lightning caster or if you play a bow build or if you play a melee build, essentially just try to find synergies that have like the same stats. And along those here you have like these so-called travel nodes. So typically these stats don't really do that much besides giving you the required attributes that you need to wear certain items or to level your gems. And typically you go for these so-called clusters here. So you're, you see here we travel along this path, uh, one, two, three, four, and you have like these bigger nodes. These are called notables and they typically have a bigger effect and you want to go for these that uh, kind of like give you a, a special effect in some way or is it simply stronger than the small ones. You see like this, the bigger ones always have a bit more juice. The good part is you don't need to look at everything at once. You can just find whatever you're looking for. For example, you can type fire and it will highlight anything that has the word fire in it. And you can see here that there's some stuff lighting up. So this is something that I could be going for. In fact, I'm actually pathing towards this right now. So here's more fire damage that I can take on a tree. And this is where I ended up right now with my character after reaching level 58 so far. And uh, you can also find life, for example. Life is very important. So a lot of stuff really hurts. You die very easily, especially when you don't know what's going on. There will be a lot of deaths in your playthrough. And this is just how the way that things go. But this helps you go for life nodes on your tree and uh, try to stack life on your items a little bit and then this will make things a lot easier. So it doesn't matter what kind of build you're playing. If you start out as a ranger for example and you play a bow build then you also see here you have bow nodes everywhere, you have like projectile damage. So all these things kind of work together. You have lots of attack speed here and then there's like bow stuff and then there's uh, bow crit and in between you have like some other stats. So I always have to like look around a little bit but as I said, just try to find the synergies and try to scale through the same mechanic with your build. And to that end, because I was gaining a lot of elemental damage and fire damage, I should be focusing on the fire spells. But in the end, it doesn't really matter too much which fire spell I use. You don't have to worry too much because you can also respec. It is a bit costly, but throughout the campaign you get some respec points for free. And then you can just like refund passives and you can uh, remove them one by one again here. Uh, apply the refund and you get a point back. So like this you can basically unskill your tree a little bit and maybe adjust a little bit. Especially uh, towards end game you usually change some stuff around but uh, this is not really too relevant for the campaign. Typically when you start out the game I would recommend playing a spellcaster. So you can play for example a Templar or a Shadow or a Witch because these are like the, the spellcasting classes generally and then it makes it much easier to progress because you're not really uh, focusing on item drops too much. If you're playing a melee or a bow build then typically you acquire a really good weapon and you have to constantly replace that weapon and some of your other gear with better damage rolls etc because spells scale on their own. They have like a fixed damage value that is like the, kind of like the base damage. You can see here deals 10 to 16 damage is like a level 2 fireball and then like this le skill levels up as you level and uh, attacks don't really do that. They typically do like a percentage of your weapon damage and then scale very very slowly. So this is why typically leveling is extremely easy with spell casters and then much harder and uh, definitely recommended for more experienced players. But you can do it. It's not like you know at the end of the world if you play a bow character but it's typically considered more difficult. So one specialty about this passive tree is that every class has the same tree and they all just start at a different point. So you see here right now I'm the Templar and I'll start here in the top left and then we have the Witch who starts here and we have the Shadow who starts here and they all go along the same path essentially. They just have like basically a different starting point and a different kind of like 
specialized region. For example, the witch has a lot of like spell casting stuff, a lot of elemental stuff, a lot of minion stuff. Then you have the Templar area, where it's like, yeah, basically a combination of a lot of spell casting with a bit of melee. And then you have the Marauder here, which is like a very like melee heavy with weapon specializations, lots of life. And here's like the Ranger area, for example, with a lot of bow stuff. So there is like a lot of like a concept to this tree, but you can still find, you know, different things in different places. And all of these classes have a subclass called Ascendancy. For example, here I am an Inquisitor, so I'm a Templar and that has ascended to Inquisitor. That's also called Hierophant and there's also a Guardian. So one is kind of like the support type of character. Here I'm like a um, elemental, very crit heavy build that I can do. And again, you would just try to find the synergies that would work for your build. Now, when it comes to loot, there are some things you need to know. Life is very important and resists are very important, especially for spellcasters where your damage doesn't really depend too much on your weapon. You don't really care too much about the damage stats. You just want to stack life, you want to stack maybe some mana or mana region, you want to stack the resists. Especially resists are very important later in the campaign. So after Act 6 especially, you want to be capped. The cap is 75% resist. So always try to stack that a little bit because else you're gonna get completely shredded. Resists here effectively reduce the incoming damage by exactly this amount. So in my case, I get 75% reduced cold damage and lightning and fire damage. And this is what the game is balanced around. So you need to cap your resist at all costs later throughout the campaign. And essentially just try to find whatever works for you. Especially important are the sockets though. So as a spellcaster here, I need a lot of blue sockets because blue is intelligence. Intelligence is like the spell stuff. And when you level, you want to mostly look at the items that have the right colors and the right links, at least for like two or three of your slots. So you can actually make those combos with those links because each of the skill links and the, the support links actually adds a lot of extra damage to your character or to your spell. And then you have like some other slots that give you simply more stats. And with those, you can try to get your life and your resist, but mostly focus on maybe two or three items that have uh, a lot of links and the right colors. So when you fight your way through the, uh, the enemies, you will see a different uh, loot drop. And for me, this actually looks a bit different now than it usually does. You see that uh, like certain things pop up here on the screen now. And when I press Alt, I can actually see even more loot. And this is the concept of loot filters in this game. There's a lot of stuff dropping on the ground and a lot of it is really worthless and you don't really want to pick up all that stuff because it's simply too much. And this is just the beginning of the game. Eventually you drop hundreds of items everywhere on the screen. And this is why you need loot filters. I can show you how this works. So like now I have this like pretty standard filter. And if I turn this off, everything will look different. So this is how the game looks normally. And so it is already like a little bit color coded. So these are like magic items. These are white items. And you can see these sockets here, they are actually displayed as little colored dots on the item itself. And you can see, for example, here, we found some boots that have a link. So you can actually see the little link between them. And these are actually four linked boots here. So this is pretty neat. And then, for example, you have like some other random stuff that, you know, it, it might be magic or it might be even a yellow item that has more properties. But if it doesn't have the right links, then typically I would not really care too much about it. But essentially, even at the start of the game, you should get a loot filter because it makes your experience so much easier and it also highlights um, the stuff that is more important for you. So typically like a lot of the mini user stuff is already like filtered out immediately because you don't need any of these like white items typically. They're not really worth anything. This will just drop. The way to get a loot filter is on this website here. Uh, you can just uh, go here after the link in the description and uh, essentially they have like a kind of like a standout fil filter that is fine. So you can basically just press download and you can also adjust these things. You can, you know, hide certain things. You can make them look different. You can change the colors. You can do anything. But uh, for now, just press download and then install it in your documents folder, My Games Path of Exile. And uh, then you get the selection here in the UI menu in game. And this will uh, change here. The thing about loot in this game is also that you don't have any kind of gold dropping or something, but there are these so-called currencies. They are essentially crafting items. So you see here, for example, a scroll of wisdom is used to identify an item. Actually, uh, identifying it also increases the value at the vendor. And for it, you can get some uh, alteration shards and they don't really do anything on their own. But for example, when you combine 20, you get this orb of alteration. And this is how most of the currency works. All of it 
does something, so to say. So you can craft items with this, you can make them magic, you can make them rare, and you can reroll rare items, and there's you know, dozens of currencies that all kind of work for something in the game. So especially at the start of the game, you want to pick up a lot of stuff, especially like blue and yellow items and all the scrolls that you find. So they are really useful because you want to keep identifying items, you want to see uh, what you can maybe wear and then as you progress you basically pick up, pick up less and less of the random blue and yellow items because you already have you know some decent loot here and anything that is not another falling glove I don't really care too much about for now. And lastly when it comes to loot you should also know that there's certain uh, vendor recipes. So you can go to the vendor here and essentially just vendor the stuff that it just found. So if you get, give them this blue item you get these alteration shards they are useful to um, re-roll re a magic item. So don't really worry too much about collecting loot throughout the campaign. You can use it very freely to try to craft some items maybe. Here's the overview of the campaign. So there's a UI menu. These are the different zones. When you play through a campaign, what is important is there are main quests, which are uh, highlighted in like, yellow color. And there's optional quests. A lot of these you don't have to do, but some of them you have to do because you get skill points for them. You can find a full list of uh, what those are here. I'll also have the link for this. And in total, I think it gets up to 22 of them. And um, essentially, you can skip all, like there's a lot of side areas you can skip entirely. If you want to explore, okay. But keep in mind, it's a very long campaign with 10 acts. And especially playing through it the first time will take quite a while. You can easily look at 10, 20 hours or so, even more in some cases. And the good thing is that the quest is always highlighted, so you can just uh, click on this and it'll tell you where to go. There's like this little orange path from your position to wherever you need to go. Uh, these little dots here mean that there's a waypoint in the zone. One important thing is in Act 2, I just want to highlight this quest especially, it's called Deal with the Bandits, and you have to go kind of back and forth. And what I would recommend is to, from the town, go to the eastern side, clear all of this, uh, kill the guy here on Broken Bridge and then you go to the western side. This way will save you a lot of backtracking in Act 2 and it can be quite frustrating for new players. Otherwise most of the other acts are like smooth sailing, uh, one path and uh, everything is fine as long as you follow the main quest line. Lastly, throughout the campaign you will find these so-called Trials of Ascendancy. This is what is needed to gain the Ascendancy, to actually enter the Labyrinth. And uh, it's basically a little zone with some traps and you have to uh, walk through it and at the end, once you pass through, you have to click like a little uh, altar and that will unlock that trial. And this is what's needed to go to a labyrinth and get your trial of sanity. This is quite important. So when you find these, you have like a little um, uh, sort of like a green quest in that area. And you know that in this area, you will have to do one of these. Just make sure that you do these trials. And then after Act 3, you can do your first labyrinth. After Act 7, you can do the second one. And after the full campaign, you can do the third one. And that's about it for this guide. So I hope that this helps you. And if you want to jump into the game, now is a really good time for it. And uh, well, and try to keep it as short as possible. But there is uh, some things that you need to ex have explained in the game. And I hope that I could cover it all with at least uh, the bare basics. And then you can start building your knowledge base from there. What I can recommend is try out the wiki here. So this is a PoE wiki. You can search for any skill, unique, uh, legendary, whatever, any quest, any monster. There's a lot of stuff to learn and there's a lot of information out there that will help you. And also there's the in-game tutorial that pops up when you start this game. Uh, you can check that out too because it's actually quite helpful. So take a minute here and there to check out, you know, whatever pops up on the help pages there and that can also help you a great deal. So that's it. I hope you liked this video and see you guys next time.